Well, I work for the Department of Historic Trades at Colonial Williamsburg. And here at what we call the Colonial Garden, we are endeavoring to preserve and interpret the trade of an 18th century professional gardener. And Williamsburg did have professionally trained gardeners employed at both the College of William and Mary and at the Governor's Palace throughout the colonial period. And while their responsibilities span most facets of horticulture, their primary responsibility was to provide produce to the table all year round. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We'll look first at the history of the development of the tools and the techniques that made this possible. And I'll show you how we do it at our garden and how you can do it at your garden. So let's begin at the beginning. <laughs> we can advance the theory that civilization evolved around the novel idea of bringing wild food plants into a garden. This allowed a formerly nomadic people to settle in one place and form cities, states, and eventually nations. But over the millennia, as we became more prosperous, as we became better gardeners, simply having food plants in their natural season or their natural climate was not enough. And this consumer revolution really takes root, as it were, in the 18th century, when gardeners for the first time perfect the use of hotbeds with frames and glasses to produce produce all the year round. It was a long time coming. The first person I can discover to have a fruit or vegetable out of season was the Roman Emperor Tiberius. Tiberius ruled between 14 and 37 CE, and it's long been said he ate a cucumber on every day of the year. We have this from no less a source than Pliny the Elder, who recorded in his voluminous natural history, published sometime before 79 CE, Book 19, Chapter 23, that the cucumber was a delicacy for which the Emperor Tiberius had a remarkable partiality. In fact, there was never a day on which he was not supplied with it. As his kitchen gardeners had cucumber beds mounted on wheels, which they moved out into the sun, and then on wintry days withdrew under the cover of frames glazed with transparent stone. And this is the legend that's come down to us all these centuries as an example of the world's first proto-greenhouse. However, Pliny, or Tiberius for that matter, never actually said the word cucumber. They were speaking Latin. What they said was cucumus, which has long been interpreted as cucumber. <coughs> But just within the last couple of years, two of the world's experts on the Kirkabit family, Jules Janik from Purdue and Harry Paris from Israel, have re-examined this legend, and I think proved conclusively that it's not a cucumber at all, but a melon. Known today as an Armenian melon, the serpent and the snake melon, and coincidentally enough, when it was first introduced to Williamsburg in 1737, to the astonishment of everyone, it was called the turkey cucumber. Because although it is a true melon, as you can see from the central seed cavity, it tastes very much like a sweet cucumber. Now, with the fall of the Roman Empire, Europe retreats behind castle walls. And the art and science of gardening and many other arts and sciences come to a screeching halt. But uh, we often forget, which Scott mentioned, that while most of Europe is struggling through the Dark Ages, over in Moorish Spain, they're building grand palaces and amassing great libraries and really becoming very good gardeners. So we see a lot of these early techniques and early garden varieties come to us out of Moorish Spain. And the most significant garden technique was the development of the hotbed. Now, a hotbed is simply a pile of composting manure, which translates its heat to a layer of soil put on top of it for germinating your seeds or raising plants out of season. And the first person to talk about it is Ibn Basal, who was a gardener of the Sultan of Toledo. And recorded in 1085, we use soft, slightly dried out mule or horse dung, free of all foreign bodies. Then in the evening, to retain the heat, we cover the beds with a canopy of cabbage or cauliflower leaves. Now, it's almost another 500 years before we hear about hotbeds in England, where they're first recorded by Thomas Hill in the Gardener's Labyrinth, published in 1577, again in regard to cucumbers. But this time, it was a true cucumber. The cucumber is native to the foothills of the Himalayas and has been domesticated in India for at least 2,000 years, but was somewhat slow making its way to Europe, not being recorded in Italy until the 12th century. Now, Hill mentions cucumbers and hotbeds, but he does not give us any directions. For that, we have to wait another 20 years for the publication of John Gerard's famous herbal or general history of plants. And what Gerard tells us, again, in regard to cucumbers, that in the middle of April, or somewhat sooner, you should be caused to be made a better bank of hot and new horse dung taken forth of the stable, which bank you shall cover with hoops or poles that you may the more conveniently cover the whole bed or bank with mats, old painted cloth, strew, or such like to keep it from the injury of the cold, frosty nights. So the advance, the advance here is he's replaced the cabbage leaves with hoops, probably very much like the hoops we cover our broccoli with in Williamsburg. Now, broccoli in the 18th century is purple, and it's a biennial, meaning you have to go over winter season to form its florets. You plant this in the spring, you get nothing but leaves. It's a tremendously cold, hardy plant, but we find that by giving a little bit of cover in the coldest part of the winter, we get this much earlier, more robust crop of these beautiful purple heads of broccoli. 
Now what you're getting to market today is Calabrese, named for the province of Calabria, all the way in the tip of Italy. Now that's only been to stores since about the 1930s. It's one of the more modern vegetables on your table. This is what brought us back to most of history. Now Calabrese has been developed for the commercial market. So if you plant 12 Calabrese plants in the spring, being the annual, you can plant spring and fall, you're going to have 12 heads of Calabrese broccoli all on the same day three months later. Now that's what the big growers want. They want the fields to come in uniformly so they can send the workers out there and pick it and wrap it and ship it and get it to market. The purple broccoli, you're picking this every two or three days for about a month and a half. Uh, now you can't send workers out in the field every two or three days, but for the home gardener, this may be the better option. I think it's a sweeter broccoli than the Calabrese is. <laughs> and for your organic gardeners, you get the caterpillar from the cabbage white butterfly and that Calabrese broccoli, I don't care how much salt water you use, you can't find, you can't get it out. And then you find that half caterpillar that bombed your plate of broccoli and you know where the other half went. <laughs> On the purple broccoli, these looser heads, the purple um, full, um, florets, it's easy to clean. So I think this is a broccoli that's worth considering. The caveat being, you must plant it in the fall. Now the next improvement comes in regard to the melon. And this time it is the round melon, the musk melon or cantaloupe, which seems to be a new phenomena in the first century for plenty writes about it. Curious to say, just recently, a new form of cucumis has been produced in Campania. A remarkable thing about them, besides their shape, color, and smell, is that when they have ripened, although they are not hanging down, they at once separate from the stalk. So the difference here is that unlike the serpent melon, they're round, the color, they're buff, not green, and the smell is that delightful cantaloupe smell you're all familiar with. And the convenient thing about musk melons, when they're ripe, a little bit of pressure with your thumb on the stalk, they'll separate from the fruit. This apparently wasn't a very good melon, though, because we hear hardly a word about it for the next 1,500 years. I suspect it was much like what we call a pocket melon today, which is grown just for its fragrance. The sweet melon seems to originate in the area around the Black Sea, and it's introduced to Italy in the, fourth, in the 15th century to a papal state near Rome by the name of Cantalupa, House of the Wolf, where we get our word cantaloupe from. And the improvement here, again, is in regard to the covering. For this, we turn to John Gerard, who writes in Paradisi and Soul, published in 1629, in regards to melons. Then having prepared a hotbed of dung in April, set your seeds thereon to raise them up and cover them and order them with as great or care or greater than cowcumbers. Some use great hollow glasses like under bell heads. And now we see the introduction of the bell glass. Now this is actually a French garden here, but it shows the hotbeds. Now the typical hotbed in the 18th century was built above ground. So here's the manure with the soil laid over the top. We use the pit hotbeds, as you see to the left of it. Yeah, left of it. This picture's been cleaned up a little bit. To do these hotbeds, you're gonna have a lot of manure around the outside of it, and you people have become kind of funny about walking in manure in the 21st century, so we use the pit hotbeds, a little bit more sanitary. <laughs> now on the right side, I don't know what's going on here. You can suppose that this is facing south for better exposure, but if you look at the shadow line, the sun is clearly over here. That makes no sense at all. And even if it was facing south, the plants are still going to go straight up and down. So this just would not work. And it points out one of the pitfalls of doing historic research is just because somebody wrote it or drew it two or three or four hundred years ago, it does not necessarily mean it's accurate. This was the World Wide Web of the 18th century. And like the World Wide Web of the 21st century, there are a lot of inaccuracies in it. Now, at about the same time these techniques are coming into England, we also have Huguenots um, fleeing persecution. Oh, I should mention first, at the same time the bell glass show up, the hand lights show up. Now, these are more expensive to buy initially, but the advantage is if you break any part of a bell glass, you've ruined the tool. If you lose a painting out of a hand light, you can replace it. And the most popular type was the one you see second to the, to the left, has that removable hot that you can spin 90 degrees on a hotter day. Along with this, we come Huguenots who set up these big market gardens in the Chelsea and Battersea regions of England, or of London, and start practicing a brand new way of gardening. In fact, William Lawson records in 1617 that they dig the ground so intensively he fears that they will ruin it. And certainly what they're doing is what we call this very day French intensive gardening, with a double digging, they lose lots of manure. The next year in 1618, Bussini, who was a chaplain of the Venetian ambassador, records they're producing artichokes on hotbeds 10 months out of the year. Now artichoke's a big plant. You can't fit an artichoke under a bell glass. So likely what they're using were frames, much as you see in this Dutch work here. Now the Dutch were the finest market gardeners of the 17th century. Um, but by the next century, the English themselves are very accomplished in the art, and probably the best of them all was Philip Miller, 
who was the superintendent of the Chelsea Physic Garden, author of the Gardener's Dictionary, the most, the most authoritative work of the time. And the frames you see at the Chelsea Physic Garden today are probably very much like the frames Mr. Miller would have used during the 18th century. Now, the final innovation comes in regard to the pineapple. The pineapple is a new world crop, likely native to coastal Venezuela, but by the time the first Europeans arrived, it's being grown throughout tropical South and Central America. It's recorded first by the Spanish, as you would imagine, 1535. It's known in France by 1570. It's first recorded in England in Johnson's uh, revised edition of the herbal, published in 1633, and it's in the appendix. Those few plants were put in just before it went to press, which dates it pretty closely to its introduction date. Now, it's long been said the first European to successfully grow a pineapple from a top was a Dutchman by the name of Agnes Block, who accomplishes the feat sometime around 1687. Now, who the first Englishman was to grow a pineapple is the subject of some debate. For many years, this portrait was used to document the first successful growth of a pineapple in England. This is John Rose, the royal gardener, presenting a pineapple to Charles II. In the year 1668, almost 20 years before Mr. Block is said to grow his pineapple, which the English use as proof of their preeminence in the art ministry of pineapple growing. However, since that time, some problems have been showed up with this painting. For example, there may or may not be such a building as this, and there may or may not be such a garden as that. What this seems to be is a kind of service award, in which the king and the perhaps his fictional background is already painted in, and then for a job well done, you get to have your portrait added with your monarch. For whatever reason, John Rose chose to have his portrait added with a pineapple, so clearly something important with pineapples going on here. It's doubtful that he grew this from the top for a number of reasons, but pineapples were being imported in London by this time. The problem with sending a pineapple over from the West Indies to London is kind of like you buying a pineapple here in Alexandria, getting on your bicycle and delivering it to Omaha. It can take a couple months. So one thing they were experimenting with was to dig up entire pineapple plants with the green fruit already formed, bundling them together in the hole of the ship, shipping them to England, and trying to revive them and, and ripen them in the stove house. And this perhaps is what Mr. Rose is celebrating here. A man who was in the position to know, Richard Bradley, recorded in the Botanic Dictionary in 1728 that actually it was 1721 that Henry Tallandy, who was the first to brought to rejoice in our climate in Sir Matthew Decker's fine gardens in Richmond. And what Tallandy does is he replaces the manure with tan bark. Now tan bark is a waste material from tanning leather. And the way we tan leather in the 18th century is that we dig these holes in the ground, put in a layer of hide, a layer of bark, something like oak bark, high in tannic acid, layer of hide, layer of bark. You keep it under water for a number of days. The hide that comes out is now tanned. The bark you can use for the hotbed. Now you can get six, maybe eight weeks of heat out of a manure straw hotbed. They record getting up to five months of heat out of a tan bark bed. And as the pineapple takes a little bit better than two years to come in from her top, this would be very, very valuable. Now we have a mystery in Williamsburg, which Kent alluded to, at the governor's palace. This is a Frenchman's map, done in 1781 by an unknown hand for the building of Rochambeau's troop while they were in town ready to march on Yorktown. It concerns this building right here. All the way up, this L-shaped building all the way up to here at the governor's palace. Now to orient you, this is the Duke of Gloucester Street, the capital here, College of William Mary. Here's Bruton Parish Church. My little garden sits right here. Now, the L-shaped building was originally interpreted by archaeologists as a stable, because one of the things they found there was a highly enriched organic soil, which they interpreted as the remains of manure and straw. Um, here's where it sits in the garden today, what we now call a fruit garden. This was the wall back here. But just as construction was underway in 1933, Arthur Shercliffe, our first landscape architect, had a revelation and wrote this letter to President Chorley. Since writing the bulk of this report and trying to decipher the curious remains of what we have thought to be the foundations of a stable, I suddenly saw that these remains perfectly fit the design of a lean-to grape house of the early kinds I have just seen in England. The relatively thin front retaining wall of low height, the thick and high rear wall, the central low-level paved walk, the interior marginal loan space, Italian position, and in size with those grape houses. The long duct to the north wall, this is the important part, corresponds exactly with the heating flue of those grape houses. The central enlargement of the foundations corresponds with the plan and elevation of the central pavilion, sometimes called the palm of grass. Um, grass. And he drew this conjectural sketch, which Kent showed you yesterday. Now this was clearly a nursery area, because it's in this area here, we find the bulk of the bell glass fragments and the pottery fragments. And this is on the other side of the wall 
from the main gardens. This was a work area. Just up from it, which is now the Revolutionary War Cemetery, we found 156 bodies there. That was probably the kitchen gardens. This was the working side of the palace gardens. I think Shercliffe was half right. The two sides are quite different. The one on the left is a 10-foot section, one on the left is a 7-foot section. And looking through the, um, the archaeological reports, the photographs, and the drawings, the one on the left side does have this marginal loan space which Shercliffe talks about with the central pavilion of bricks. And if you look at the grape house at Hampton Court, that's how they grow the grapes. They train them just upside the wall, under the glass, that central pavilion where you set your pots around. The right-hand side, though, is the seven feet section. It has this up and down configuration, and then the steps up the back wall, which Kent mentioned yesterday. Very much like you see here in Miller's stove house. Now, what makes these go, as Kent mentioned, was this central wall, which gives indirect heat to the growing place. The charcoal braziers and the coal stoves that was used in the last century had a couple drawbacks. One of them was they vastly increased the carbon monoxide content of the house, which didn't bother the plants very much, it bothered the gardeners quite a lot. <laughs> the other problem is, and anybody who's lived with a wood stove can attest, is how severely this dries the environment out. So the mites just must run wild in these old citrus trees. In this case, because it's fired from this room back here, for these stoves, you never draw air through the growing place. You're not drying the atmosphere out. But what really makes it go are the tan bark shown in the bottom. As the tan bark breaks down, it heats up the, so heats up the pots, provides moisture to the air. And I think that's the source of this highly enriched organic soil the archaeologists found. Now, we know that Lord Dunmore, the last royal governor of the colony of Virginia, ate the pineapple in Virginia. The question is, did he grow the pineapple? Back home in Scotland, he built the world's biggest pineapple. <laughs> This is a pinery at Dun uh, uh, Dunmore Woods. Um, in fact, I understand you can stay in these little um, places now as a dormitory. So, using the historic record, we decided to see if we too could garden all year round. <coughs> now, the easiest thing you can do is just put straw down. This in Williamsburg and this area too will keep your ground from freezing, so you can just keep your root crops in right through the winter time. We have here the parsnips. This is salsify or oyster root. Some of your big winter radishes. Of course, the turnips you can do with carrots over the winter time. And most of your roots, and particularly the parsnips, really need to go through a frost to develop their sweetness. So we're typically not digging parsnips until January. We get this wonderful crop of parsnips in the middle of winter time. How many of you eat parsnips? Well, actually, that's quite a number for most groups. Americans, by and large, have seemed to have forgotten how to eat parsnips, but I'm glad to see this group has rediscovered it. Of course, the Cadillac of the garden was the turnip, because you can eat not only the root, but the leaves. And as I say, all plants protect themselves from frost by converting starch to sugar. It makes like a natural antifreeze. So not only can you eat the top, you can eat the bottom. As Dean mentioned, I came to Williamsburg from Maine. In Maine, we eat the root and throw the top away. I come to Virginia, eat the top and throw the root away. <laughs> And the purple top is what most people are growing, but there's much more to know about turnips than this. Um, the white egg turnip on the right is um, kind of a spicy flavor to it, without that cabbage-y flavor that the purple top has. The French turnip on the left, the boule d'or, it's a very, very sweet turnip. If you don't quite like turnips, I'd try the boule d'or. That's a very good turnip. And of course, the iconic vegetable of the South is the collard greens. Have, has the collard greens reached Iowa yet? Yes. <laughs> not quite, though. Not quite. No. Yeah, civilization is on the way. <laughs> Don't despair. <laughs> this is an heirloom variety called the Green Glaze Collard, which is one of the first named varieties of collards in North America, probably developed around 1806. Um, collard was the most ancient form of cabbage. In fact, when you read the Roman and the Greek literature, what's translated as cabbage is actually what you would recognize as a collard. The heading cabbage comes about much later. Um, the coal wort seems to go extinct in England around 1815, but preserved in the American South, primarily by American blacks that give us the collard green. Now, the green glaze is a somewhat smaller plant, a thicker, glossier leaf. People are starting to saute with collards. This is a good candidate for that, but if you're doing it the way my wife does, who grew up in the South, in a big old pot and a slow boil for two or three hours, a little bit of fat back in the bottom, throw in some new potatoes, last 20 minutes or so, serve it up, dice on your pepper vinegar, and now you're eating. <laughs> Probably the vase or the Georgias is still the better collard. Now, even more cold hardy, and wintertime is, by the way, the time of roots and greens. That's where we're getting the winter months. Um, and this last winter was a test of all the different kale varieties. And the Scotch kale, the curry kale, was by far, hands down, the most cold hardy of all. And this went through this winter untouched. Um, it's not the best flavor of the kales, however, in my opinion. Um, I like the Siberian kale, which is a much better flavor. Now, this winter, these were knocked down, but they came right back from the crown. 
Perhaps the mildest flavor of all is what's called the Tuscan kale, the Lancinata kale, or the black palm kale, the dinosaur kale, goes by lots of different names. This is so mild, these young leaves in the middle, you can put that in a green salad. It's delicious flavored. This is the one used most commonly in the kale soups, like the Calverde that the Portuguese are famous for. And this one, if you can get it through the winter time, under a high tunnel, for example, I was talking with a lady yesterday about, when the florets come up, these florets are absolutely delicious. You cut them, you can saute with them, you can put them in a stir fry, they have kind of a broccoli flavor to them. So at the very end of the kale season, this is kind of the treat you get. Now even more cold hardy than the kales are the spinaches. In fact, in Maine, I would sow my spinach in the fall, and as long as I kept the snow cover over the winter time, it would go right through the winter for a better harvest in the spring. Now the problem with spring sown spinach is by the time it's big enough to eat, it goes right straight to flower on you. So you really need to get your spinach in the fall time. I get kids in, the Jan in January in the garden who tell me they don't like uh, spinach. I can change your mind about spinach in January. Because now it's been frosted down hard, it tenderizes, it takes away that bitter flavor that you and I don't taste too much anymore, but kids still do. Um, so wonderful time of the year for spinach. At the bottom is what the English call corn salad or lamb's lettuce, the French call it mosh, the Germans call it felt salad. Um, tremendously cold hardy green and one of the small salads which we've kind of forgotten about. Um, a couple of small salads we've rediscovered is what I would call rocket, you would call arugula, what I would call coriander, you would call cilantro, but there's cresses and mustards and sal burnets and lovages and alexanders and sorrels, lots and lots of these small salads that really spice up the salad of the vichyssoise. So many, many of these to be discovered. Now, my best crop of cabbages is my winter crop. Again, because it's frosted, so it's the sweetest, and also I don't have the pressure from the cabbage white butterfly. Um, my smooth or white cabbage, as they were called, is the late fall and the early winter cabbage. Um, if it gets real cold early on, I'll just throw some brush over the top of it. That's enough to keep that dead air space and keep my cabbages good right through the winter. If they formed a head, that head will freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw and be perfectly fine. If it hasn't headed by the first frost, it's not going to head. But you can then harvest it at what they called a cabbage colwort in the 18th century, which is a sweeter version of a collard. And the most cold hardy of your cabbages is a Savoy cabbage. I think it's the sweetest cabbage, too. You go to the grocery store, you'll get a head of Savoy for $2.50 that big around, and right next to it's a common cabbage for 70 cents. This is just as easy as a common cabbage is to grow. I think it's the better cabbage, and it's certainly the most cold hardy. So this is our late winter, our February, March cabbage. Now a little bit more elaborate use of straw is over by broad beans, or what Americans know if they know it at all by the time of fava beans. This is the old world bean. This is a bean we lived on for 10,000 years before coming to the new world. In fact, our new world bean is called bean because it puts its mind at this plant here. No reason to make up new words if you have old ones handy. But the old world bean is a cool season bean. So here in the middle, this is kind of the hardest part to grow them. Farther north, you can plant them in the ground as soon as the snow comes out, even before you plant your peas. Farther to the south, you can grow them as a winter crop. In the middle stage, so you have to starve them in the fall, get them over the winter for a harvest in the spring. I'll start mine in late November. They generally come up Christmas week. My aim is to get them to be about three inches tall and carry them over the winter under this frame. In fact, this comes from a very old piece of advice from Thomas Tusser, who in 1573 writes 500 points of good husbandry meant to instruct his wife and care of the household in the garden, but being a cautious man, he writes it all in poetry. And what he says about protecting strawberries, which should protect the same way where the structure comes from, is, if frost should continue, take this for a law, the strawberries look to be covered with straw, laid over trim, on crotches and boughs, and after uncovered, its weather allows. And so with it, we all can instruct our wives in so congenial fashion, or in any fashion. So I'll put it on at night, take it off during the day, and they'll go right through the winter time for harvest in May. Now this again, winter was the test. Um, this was a very poor season. I did have some broad beans this year, but not near the harvest I usually get. We grow them up to about this size here, and then what I'll do is I'll take this away, cut this right in half, stand the two ends up, I'll grow my cucumbers up at this summer. Now on either side, we see the paper frames, these, these row type covers. This is the device I can put right in town. John Randolph, who was the last royal attorney general for the colony, wrote this country's first garden book called A Treatise on Gardening. Um, now you see he does not sign it, but we know he wrote from a couple of references, one being Mr. Um, Jefferson. Not sure when he wrote it, probably in the middle 1760s. Um, he was a loyalist, returned to England in 1775, so it had to be written before then. We're real excited about this little book because up until about 12, 15 years ago, there were no known 18th century copies of this that existed. 
And then out at Hollins University in Roanoke, Virginia, down the basement of the library, tucked away in a box for who knows how many years, out pops the only known 18th century copy of this work. You see, it's a 1793 edition, Randolph's dead by now, published in Richmond, probably by Minton Collins. Um, Hollins University was kind enough to loan us the original, and our colonial printers have now made an exact copy, same size, same typeset. So now, for the first time in over 200 years, this copy is again available to the public. Now, Randolph tells us these, these hoop covers, these paper covers, are called melon frames. Randolph tells us the early sewing should be covered with oil paper in preference to glasses. May use lead as an imitation of covered wagons. Now, if you read Randolph's treatise written in Williamsburg and compare it to Philip Miller's The Gardener's Dictionary written in England, in many places Randolph is word for word Miller. He'd be prosecuted in the days of society for plagiarism, but plagiarism is a long and held tradition amongst garden writers. <laughs> But with a careful reading of Randolph, I can tell from the Latin he's using, he's working either from the 1754 folio edition, or the or 1754 abridged edition, or the 1757 folio edition. So I go back to that edition in our rear books, and Miller shows us two types of melon frames. The bottom one with the side of the action is up, and the top one. So Randolph, when he tells me to cover my melons with hoops, much like those that cover wagons, I can be very certain I'm looking at the same picture he's looking at. We, paper in the 18th century was made from cotton or linen or cotton linen blend. Um, so we glue the paper to the frame with hide glue, which comes from a particular type of a horse. That being a dead horse. <laughs> <laughs> and then we paint it with linseed oil, which comes from the seed of the flax plant, which makes it waterproof and somewhat transparent. And this is used over the melons when they first come out from the hotbed. To keep the sun and the wind off so they don't wilt, it's very important you do not let your transplants wilt. If you let your transplants wilt, you've lost two weeks off the harvest right there, and the plant that recovers is never as strong as the plant that you planted in the ground. So we leave this under the frame for usually a couple weeks until I see new growth coming onto it, and the frame will be taken away Dig a trench around the outside. It's long, I don't, you know, the things we practice here that I get wisdom of the 18th century, I'm not always sure whether it's true or not, but we, go, we carry on. <laughs> All the wisdom tells me to dig a trench around the outside because melon should not be watered over the top of the foliage. I think this puts somebody some good advice there. It also allows the water to run away from it in big rains. So I'll water it like this until the fruit starts to form, then I'll stop watering altogether. Melons need to come to fruit when it's dry. In fact, this last summer, which was so wet, was a good test for the different types of melons in rainy, rainy weather. Even the melons we got from the farmer's markets in Williamsburg had almost no flavor to them whatsoever. But we found the pineapple melon, which was one of Jefferson's favorite melons. It's the green flesh musk melon, held in sweetness even in that very wet weather. When we get into wet weather, I'll take my frame back out, put it upon bricks over the crown of the plant, and that can preserve some of the sweetness for me. A little bit more protection than the paper frames are the bell glasses at the top, and then for the transplants, the, the straw bells at the bottom, in order to guard them from the heat of the sun, which might annoy them at first. I like this kind of first-person relationship we have with our, our garden in the 18th century. Um, the bell glass I use, or the straw bells I use over my cucumbers, again, so they don't wilt, I'll leave them, and actually here is the frame stood up. So here's what was over the beans, now I've stood it up. Cucumbers are much better if you let them climb. They want to climb, nature has provided them with tendrils, the fruit are easier to find, they're straighter, so cucumbers you want to let climb. I'll leave them under the uh, straw bell for the first week, and I'll take it off during the night, put it back on in the day, once I see new growth again, I'll take it off altogether, let the cucumbers climb up the bell, up the frame here. The glass bells I use in the fall time for young transplants, and they'll go right over the winter with no harm. I use in the middle of the winter for things like parsley. Now, parsley was the premier cooking over the 18th century. I mean, you look at the recipes, they put parsley in everything. It's like the way you use garlic today. Parsley is perfectly winter hardy here, but in cold weather, the leaves will fall down and are not usable. By keeping it under the bell glass in the coldest months of the year, the cook will have parsley in the coldest months of the year. And then the spring, when the transplants come out from the hotbed, I use them again to keep the wind and the sun off or protect them from frost, particularly cauliflowers. Cauliflowers are the finicky of all the cabbage family. They're real prone for buttoning, or small, forming small curves to ruination of plants that they get too cold or too hot or too windy. Now, a little bit more protection of this is what you would call a cold frame, and I would simply call it frame. I've looked for the term cold frame in the 18th century and have never found it. I use this for growing lettuces over the winter months. And again, lettuces are much more cold hardy than we give them credit for. They're much sweeter after a frost. When it gets real cold, we'll throw straw over the top of the frame with a tarp over the top of that. That gives me that air space, just the same way your double insulated windows work. And this is the best lettuce of the year. 
It's the sweetest lettuce of the year because it's been frosted, but it's the longest lasting. My fall and my spring lettuce, once it forms a head, you have about a week to pick it before it starts to go to flower on you. The lettuce that comes in in March, or February and March for me will form that head and just sit there for a month's time. So it's the sweetest, longest lasting lettuce of the year. And then the most protection I can give to the plant is the hotbed. Now for the hotbed, we use instruction from John Reed, who wrote the Scots Garden, which was the first Scottish gardening book published in 1683. What he tells us is, as for making the hotbed for raising early and tender plants, dig a pit two foot deep enough the length and breadth as you have occasion, in a convenient and warm place lying well to the sun and sheltered from the winds. This pit will be so much more excellent if lined around the sides with brick. Now all the 18th century publications tell us that we have to have manure with straw. Manure with, for manure with straw where horses have trod, so urine soaked straw. Pure manure will not work. The problem is, is that today everybody beds the horses down in sawdust, and sawdust will not work. So we have to take the sawdust, throw it to the screen, get the sawdust on that side, the manure and the straw on this side, and as you can see from this print, in 1706, things in the life of a dunslinger have changed not very much at all in the last 300 years. <laughs> This is actually an onerous task. So now we go out, we pick it up into the pastures, we get some straw from the sheep pens, we kind of mix them together artificially. And this does give us enough heat to, to get the plant started. We throw it into a pile, let the heat come up one time, take the outside, throw them into the middle, let the heat come up the second time. We'll get 150, 160 degrees here. Load it into the wheelbarrows, into the frames. We do this in January. There's about six of you people around to see this happen in January, which is a... <laughs> One of the neatest things we do all year long, so here's another reason to come to Williamsburg in January. <laughs> we put it in, smooth it out, tamp it down as we go. If you put it in too loose, it'll get real hot real quick, but then the fire will go out. So we lay it down, pack it in, lay it down, pack it in, kind of like turning the dampers on a wood stove and restricting oxygen. Give it a final packing when we get all the way up to the top. Then I'll close it up. Let the heat come back up, and typically within a day or two, I'll run a temperature between 120 and 140 degrees on the top of the pile. Then we lay the soil on top, and what I'm using is last year's fully composted manure from the hotbed next to it. Because as we all know, seeds germinate better in organic soil than they do in a mineral soil, and this very light texture allows the pile to continue to breathe and to continue to heat. Um, Again, close it up, let the temperature settle out. You, typically within the first day or two, I'll get a temperature of 120, 110 degrees in the pile. I'll let the temperature come down between 80 and 90 degrees. Then I sow my seeds. And I always sow them too thick. I'm never optimistic enough for my seeds sowing. I bet you aren't either. And there is no way you can go through here and pull out the seed you don't want, leave the seed you do want. So you're much better off just to lift the entire row Tease them apart, holding the leaves. If you break a leaf, they'll grow a new leaf. If you break the stem, you kill the transplant. So tease them apart with holding the leaves. Put them down in the basket. You see at the bottom here, go back and prepare the soil with my dibble. Make evenly spaced holes. Again, holding the leaf. Drop them down into the holes, lightly firm around it. Water it in. And once I'm done, as far as these plants know, they've never been moved. Um, we grow them on, this, I'm doing this uh, um, in February, I'll grow them on until late March, early April. I'm look, what I'm looking for is five or six leaves, about a size like this, to transplant them. I want to transplant them on an overcast day, or what they would call dripping weather in the 18th century. You do this on a warm, sunny, dry day, you're just fighting Mother Nature, Mother Nature will always win. So do this on an overcast day. Just plunge the, your trout into the soil on all four sides to separate from the soil carefully lift it out and bring it to the garden. Now, I also never fail to sow a row of peas along the back wall here. Those will stay in the frame. In the typical years, I'm picking my first crop of peas by the middle of April, um, which is a full month and a half before I get them in the ground. Um, and again, we've become so accustomed to having any fruit, any vegetable on any day of the year that we don't realize what a rare treat this would be in the middle of April to have peas. I mean, you can invite the governor for dinner if you got peas in April in the 18th century. The second hotbed I'll start in March for my warm season crops. The peppers, the tomatoes, the melons, and the cucumbers. And because these are going to be transplanted out in warmer weather, I do start these in pots as you would. Um, the melons, or excuse me, the, the peppers, the tomatoes, I put into these pots. The cucumbers, this is my new garden apprentice, by the way. Um, my, Don McKelvey worked with me for many, many years, just retired. And um, I've replaced him with a 25-year-old girl from New York. <laughs> Things just got a lot prettier in the garden. <laughs> And you know, it, it's such a nice thing working with young people. Um, 
I mean, I love what I do. I feel very fortunate to be able to do it, but I've been doing it for 33 years. Jennifer seeing everything for the first time with so much enthusiasm and excitement. And the, and the funny thing is, I'm rediscovering the flower world through my nose. Every time I identify a plant for Jennifer, the first thing she does is smell it. I never did that. So I'm rediscovering the world around me through my nose. The melons and the cucumbers we put in these loosely woven oak baskets, which are plunged down into the soil as you see here, and we sow the seeds within it. They're growing on to about a size like this for the, the peppers and the tomatoes. Taking that, this is about what you want to see, not yet root bound, and put it into the garden. The melons and the cucumbers grow to about a size like this, and then again taking a trowel, separating from the soil on all four sides, gives you this nice round root ball to move to the garden. And if you've got, they've gotten a little bit too big, you see I've just pruned the tops off here. This will help them branch better early on. The melons go underneath the paper frames, the cucumbers go underneath uh, the straw frames, and these will be the first crops of the year. Well, in fact, what I do is I, I plant out cucumbers from the frame, and then as soon as I do that, that same day, I'll sow them from seeds. So as the cucumbers from the frame will come in first, the cucumbers from the seed will come in second. In fact, I'll get another season after the cucumbers from the frame, the mildew jumps all over, and I lose those, I'll replant seeds, I'll be my third crop. Of course, that's a trick to gardening, because all you guys know, when you garden, everything comes in at the same time. So the trick is to spread that harvest out through the year. I do leave two melons in the frame though. In fact, I should, let me go back here for just a minute. See at the very top, those melons there are not in frames. They're meant to harvest in the lab. And I'll leave the cantaloupes. In fact, most of you probably never had a cantaloupe. Which of course is a trick observation because everything you get to store today is either musk melon or winter melon. How you do being winter melon. The cantaloupes are ribbed, they're often warded. Unlike musk melons, they do not slip when they're ripe. Now some of them, like the black rock, tell you. They'll be green today, green tomorrow, green the day after that. You come out the next morning, it's turned yellow overnight. It's right. Others, such as the Prescott, are a little bit more difficult. They do not change colors so much. Um, but here you can see a green one, one almost ripe to nose, just a little bit of a green shore. That should be ripe in a couple days. These are starting to show up some of the farmers' markets. They're also called rock melons. They have great thick rinds on them, big seed cavities, not much flesh on the inside. I meet people every day in the garden who tell me heirloom vegetables are better because they're old. I think people are better because they're old. <laughs> Males not all the time. So, our primary use of covers is protecting plants from frost um, and getting them over the winter months of early harvest, but we also use them to protect them from insects. And there it is. There's that caterpillar from the imported cabbage caterpillar. It comes from this butterfly you all know flies around your garden. The boy on the left with the one spot, the girl on the right with the three spots. Now, when I first started garden, we used seven dust. Pretty bad idea. Please don't do that anymore. Um, you can use dipel, third side of the BT, but you've got to put them on repeatedly. The easiest thing to do is just throw a cover over the top. Because if the butterfly can't land, it can't lay its eggs. Now, I use cheesecloth. So that's appropriate for the 18th century, although I cannot show any documentation for this practice in the 18th century. But this butterfly does not make it to North America until 1852. So this is not a pest I would know in the 18th century. So in this case, I'm using an authentic material to control an inauthentic pest. And that's one of the fun things of gardening at, at Williamsburg. Now for my fall crop, once they outgrow this shelter here, the butterfly stopped flying, so then they're on their own. The spring crop, the crop's coming in right now though, I have to cover right to harvest. So I build this loose frame over the top of it. And as you can see, there are never enough sticks in my life, if you look in the background there. In fact, the last chapter of the book is on growing sticks. <laughs> you may laugh, but you, you cannot garden without sticks, in my opinion. And I just throw the cheesecloth over the top of it. Now, I also have a problem with some little bit larger pests. Yeah, isn't he cute? I prefer mine with rosemary and sage. <laughs> now, I don't have a big problem with rabbits, but often my first pea sowings, because there's not a lot out there, I'm sowing peas. I try to get peas on my Valentine's Day. A lot of people don't grow peas because by the time you think about gardening, it's too late to plant peas. So I try to get my peas in by Valentine's Day. There's not a lot going on. Rabbits seem to like peas as much as I do. And most of the peas I grow are the big peas. The peas porridge, hot peas porridge, cold type peas. So they take these big frames. They'll grow six, seven feet tall. And I find if I just take the cheesecloth and go around the bottom of it, the rabbits don't seem to want to jump into that confined space. So that controls rabbits for me. So I use covers for frost. I use covers for pests. I also use covers to protect plants from sun. Now, endive is a perfectly winter-hardy plant in Williamsburg, but if you let frost settle on the leaves, it browns it off. So this works like a carport to keep the, the frost off. Now, green endive, as you all know, is a very bitter green. But if you blanch it, if you keep it in complete darkness for a fortnight, it will take that away. So what we do is we go to about the size of a dinner plate. 
We tie it up on a perfectly dry day. Any moisture in this head, you're going to rot it. And it has to be done in cool weather as well. So this is the middle, middle of the winter type task. Keep it under the pot for a fortnight, two weeks. The curled endive will turn this perfect white. The broadleaf Batavian or escrow was that creamy yellow, and that, in my opinion, is the best green you can eat. That is just absolutely delicious. Now, you health conscious people will tell me why I blanch vegetables, I take out some of the minerals and the vitamins, and that is true, and why is it everything good for you has to hurt? I also blanch my cost lettuce or the romaine type lettuces, which tend to be a bitter, more coarser lettuce. I'll tie them up, and I'll tie it maybe three at a time. I don't want them all to come in at the same time. Leave them again for a fortnight or two weeks. And what this does is it concentrates the heart, it blanches the inner leaves, I pull away the outer leaves, and what I get, what you would call a day, heart's romaine, which takes the coarse bitter lettuce, makes it into a sweet, tender lettuce. Now, prior to World War II, all celery was blanched in the fields to be so stringy and bitter you couldn't eat it. In the 20th century, we just took boards, laid them either side of the trench like that. In the 18th century, they would put them in the trenches, earth them as they grow. But I find that what can be a very wet climate in Virginia, that sometimes rots them, so I have better luck if I grow them to a size like this, and I tie them up, put them in the trench, earth them around, being careful I don't get slowed down into the crown of the plant. 10 days is enough here, and what I get twist out the bottom, I get these nice white stalks of celery. Now the so-called self-blanching celery was developed after World War II, but even with the self-blanching celery, the heart, which has been blanched by the effect of the outer stems, I think is the best part of the celery. If you blanch it, the entire crop would be of this quality. Now some people at Farmers Markets will wrap them with paper to do this. I found my own house, if I just take a six-inch PVC pipe and let them grow up through the pipe, it shades itself out, which is much easier than this is. And then finally, a vegetable is very popular in Italy and Sicily, and it's grown in this country, it all is grown as an ornamental, it's a cardoon. Very close relative to the artichoke, as you can see. They can grow it two ways. You can grow it as an annual plant, seed them out. Once they get to be a size like this, size like this you tie them up, wrap them with paper, you'll blanch these stems. It's a very bitter um, stem otherwise. I like to grow them as full-size plants, uh, as perennial plants. So I get this flower show in the middle of the summertime, it is spectacular. It's this, it will stop traffic type show. Then when they come, after they're done flowering in middle of summer, July, early August, I'll cut them right to the ground, they'll go dormant, come back in September, give me nice, nice big robust plants. We'll separate out two stems, tie them up, wrap them in paper, and this time we'll let them stay for about a month. And we'll take these very coarse bitter stems, give you these nice white stems, take almost all that bitterness away. Uh, most people I meet from Southern Europe will steam it, dip an egg batter and fry it. I've had them sauteed. Um, it's a real adventure if you guys are looking for something new to try. So, we use covers for frost, we use covers for insects, we use covers to protect from sun. I found at my own house a cover of beans has been useful in raising children <laughs> and the occasional cat. So that's all I have, but for those of you who just cannot get enough of this stuff, I do do a blog every week, comes out on Wednesday, at the website you see down here, history.org, and there's a comment section so we can talk. So, wishing you a good garden season and keep in touch.